Thanks for joining us for this week's lesson at Feather Sound Church as we continue in God's Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. If I could ask you to stand, good morning to you. Let me read just something out of Psalms 27, 4. One thing I have asked of the Lord and that I will seek is that I may dwell in the house of the Lord in his presence all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty which is the delightful loveliness of his majestic grandeur and to med meditate in his temple for in the day of trouble he will hide me in his shelter in the secret place of his tent he will hide me. He will lift me up upon a rock. And now my head will be lifted up. Above my enemies that are around me. Hallelujah. And in his tent I will offer sacrifices. With shouts of joy. Shouts of joy. Amen. Hallelujah. Sing so wonderful. Wonderful, so wonderful is your unfailing love. You cross the spoken mercy over me. I have seen, no ear has heard, no heart could fully know. My 
soul, my soul must sing. My soul, my soul must sing. My soul must sing, must sing. Beautiful one, beautiful one, beautiful one I love. Beautiful one I adore. Beautiful one, my soul it must sing. You open my eyes to your wonders and you captured my heart with this love. Nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. The same God never fails, will not fail me now, won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out, working all things out. Yes, I will. You hide in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. fails, will not fail me now, will not fail me now, in the waiting, the same God who's never late, is working all things out, you're working all things out, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy on my days. Oh, yes, I will on my days. Oh, yes, I will. I choose to pray. Alan, can I have some more keyboards in the house, please? Mm -hmm. 
you know, we've gathered in his name and there's an opportunity for you here today to receive from his holiness. You might be struggling with something that you can't get rid of. There might be something pursuing you that you can't get away from. You could be struggling with some health issues here that you need a healing. Well, here's the opportunity here in his presence for you to receive his goodness, his grace, his mercy. So I want to open this altar up for anyone who has a need for an intimate time, for prayer, for an encounter with the Most High God. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. is calling Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Verse one again. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. and regrets come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling will come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Who oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior is 
His presence is here if you don't know it. And we need to wait on him. Don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high. Don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where I help.
time to sing Jesus. Jesus. your heart be trouble. Hold your head up. I don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage. Hold on. Be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Singing oh.
in praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Good worship time. If you wouldn't mind taking a moment to greet one another in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Uh, Pastor Art's on vacation. Uh, I, I talked to him earlier in the week. Uh, he's enjoying some time with his family uh, in North Carolina. Uh, earlier in the week, he was suffering from the flu or a virus or something. He was in bed the first couple days, which was kind of a bummer, but I talked to him yesterday. He's doing much better, so uh, I'm just very grateful for Pastor Art. Amen. And I'm also uh, grateful uh, to be uh, in, a, in a church, uh, even before I came here, the heritage of this church is that um, every week it starts with the words, open your Bible, amen? Uh, and we're not gonna, I'm not going to break that to tradition today. Uh, Romans chapter 10, if you uh, don't have a Bible and you want to grab one of those Bibles in front of you, it should be on page 863 or pretty close to there. Uh, Romans chapter 10. I'm so, I'm so thankful I don't have to come up with five steps to be a better this or four steps to reach this. That um, when you open up God's word, you really want to do two things. What, what, is, what is God saying and what do we do about it? Uh, and that's what uh, I'm hoping that we can do this morning. And so uh, before we do that, uh, let me pray. Father, uh, first of all, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this church, Lord. I pray you um, bless Pastor Art and his family, Lord. He would come back refreshed. And Lord, this is such a great and powerful section of Scripture. Lord, I pray, Lord, uh, that you would uh, use your servant this morning. Uh, Lord, that I would be uh, like John the Baptist said, I would decrease that Jesus may increase. Um, Father, I thank you for the rain that's falling now. Lord, I thank you, Lord. Uh, I pray, Lord, that I would be able to communicate clearly and that your spirit would be the teacher and that your spirit would have complete reign this morning. For the sake of your son, Jesus, I pray. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, listen, uh, Pastor Art, when we started nines, covered kind of the background, but we've, we're a good ways into Romans. So what I would like to do is kind of go back and look at the author. And, and the author of Romans is who? The apostle Paul. Uh, and I would like to go back to, if you want to keep your finger in Romans 10, we'll get there. But if you want to, go back a few chapters or a few books earlier to Acts chapter 7, near the end of Acts chapter 7. Uh, and I kind of want to look at uh, what's happened. This is uh, uh, Pentecost, and uh, today's Pentecost. I didn't know that until I came and prayed with Phyllis this morning. She reminded me of that. Um, but at, th at this point, after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has fallen on the church. Jesus has done his work on the cross. He has um, ascended into heaven. Uh, Peter, uh, uh, full of the Holy Spirit, preaches. Th thousands of people get saved. The church is growing. Uh, but then uh, Satan is not happy with what's going on. So he begins to attack the church. The first attack comes from outside the church. Uh, as people are getting seized. God delivers the leaders. Uh, then the church is attacked from the inside through a couple uh, by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, and God deals with the attack from inside the church rather differently than the from outside the church. I challenge you to read Acts chapter 5. That's a sermon into itself. But here again, um, uh, the, 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 the persecution on outside of the church is really going to get ramped up with a person named Stephen. Uh, Stephen is going to be the first person martyred to lose his faith or to lose his life for his faith in Christ. And I invite you to read along with me uh, in Acts chapter 7, starting in verse 54. Acts chapter 7, verse 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, what did they hear? They heard Stephen's speech, his sermon, if you will. They were happy, rejoiced, and raised their hands. That's not what it says. They weren't happy. In fact, the Bible says they were furious. They gnashed their teeth at him. 
But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up at heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. And notice who steps onto the biblical stage for the first time. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul does not have a good start. We learn from Scripture that Saul was a religious leader. He was a Pharisee. And it was very significant that the people were taking off their outer garments that would restrict their movement, laying at his feet so they could pick up bigger rocks to hurl at Stephen to take his life. Saul does not have a good start. While they were stoning Stephen... Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees, cried out, Lord, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Very similar to what Jesus uttered from the cross, isn't it? And when they said this, he fell asleep in chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of their killing him. Go one chapter ahead. Let's see how Saul is doing. Chapter 9. Let's see where Saul is now at. Chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if found any there who belonged to the way, basically anybody in the church, whether men or women, he might take them prisoners as Jerusalem. Listen, before we get started, I want to look at where Paul was. And can I say this, that Paul at the time was probably the least likely person on the planet to get saved. So we come out of chapter 9 of Romans and we hold to the doctrines that are taught there. But I want you now to turn to Romans chapter 10. And I want you to see the first verse that Paul, Saul, now Paul, so he has a, I didn't have time to read you his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. I want you to read what he now writes, where Paul was, but now where he is. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be what? Saved. If you're a note taker, I want you to write this down. My first point before we get started is, Nobody is too lost to be saved. The guy who discipled me for about the first five years, he's still a big part of my life. He doesn't live here anymore. He had a brother. He had, the whole family has like size 12 brains. Uh, uh, he was a graduate from Yale and with a master's degree. And he had a brother who was a, an electrical engineer. I don't know if it still is the case, but at the time, he had written the textbook that MIT used for electrical engineering. Brilliant guy. The guy who discipled me had witnessed to him, him and his wife, witnessed to that brother for 40 years. And for 40 years, he kicked against the goats. It was my privilege that when he came down to visit in Florida and as a church, we got on a bus and went to see an evangelist in Palm Harbor. And as the gospel was proclaimed under the power of the Spirit, I saw that man kicking against the goads for 40 years do just what I do. He got out of his pew and he walked forward and he gave his life to Christ after 40 years of that brother and his wife praying for him. Listen, nobody is too lost to get saved. I saw that man two years later. He is on fire for Christ. He shared a testimony at his home church, and 25 people got saved after sharing his testimony. Well into his 70s. Nobody is too lost to be saved. Jesus, uh, in John chapter 12, says this. Jesus speaking, John chapter 12, verse 32. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw. Thank you. Somebody knows their Bible. All men to myself. Listen, nobody is too lost. And if you have somebody in your life, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a child, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's somebody else, that a neighbor, and you have been praying, can I encourage you, do not give up? 
that person is never too lost to get saved. Amen? So the Bible clearly talks about that there are two types of people. We're going to talk later, maybe perhaps, I did in the first service, I don't know if we will, how the world tries to divide people by other things. But the Bible clearly divides people into two sections. The first section is people that referred to as they are lost. They are without hope. Their destiny is separation from God for eternity. They're lost. The second se uh, section of people, a group of people, is the people that Paul just said their desire was that they should be, they're saved. They're found. Two, two sections of people, saved and lost. Well, we're going to open up some scripture. We're going to see that Jesus talks about a group of people who are here, they're lost, but they think they're over there. They believe they're found. And can I say that being, if, if, if a person is here, and I pray there's nobody in here that is like this, but the people that are here who think they're over there, can I say with Scripture as a backup that this is a very dangerous place to be? Before we get to Romans, I promise we're going to Romans 10. I'm going to look at three teachings that Jesus talks about where he talks about just that people that are here that are lost who think they're over there, they think they're saved. Three teachings. Go to the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, and go to chapter 25. I hear pages turning. I love that sound. Jesus is going to tell a parable. A parable is a earthly story that we all can relate to that has a spiritual or heavenly meaning. Oftentimes what the a way to study a parable is that we, we look at the earthly thing that is being talked about and find out the spiritual meaning behind it. We'll try to do that right now. Jesus speaking. Matthew 25, starting in verse 1. It's called the parable of the ten virgins. At the time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the who? Bridegroom. We know from Scripture, who is the bridegroom? Jesus himself. Amen. You guys know your Bibles. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with the lamps. The bridegroom was a long time coming, and they were all drowsy and fell asleep. Listen, oftentimes, I've, I read some commentaries on this. A lot of times people try to figure out what does the lamp mean, what does the oil mean. The oil means the Holy Spirit. And listen, those things can be helpful, and they all can be true. But I think the main, the main teaching of the Jesus trying to communicate is the word readiness. He's really trying to teach about readiness. And, and notice what happens. At midnight, verse 6, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some oil, our lamps are all going out. Verse 9, no, they replied, there may be not enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived the virgins who were ready went into him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Listen, if you're uh, like me, you're a dispensational uh, rapture believer. I believe this is a clear teaching on the rapture of the church. But notice the, the, the better, that also the teaching in here is that there are ten virgins. How many of them believe in the bridegroom is coming back? All ten. They all believe in the bridegroom. They all believe the bridegroom. But five of them are over here. They're not ready. That's a dangerous place to be, isn't it? Matthew 13. Go to Matthew 13. Jesus continues with another teaching. Starting in verse 24. It's called the parable of the weeds. I kind of like, I think the King James says tares. I like that. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir... 
Didn't you sow good seed in your field? Then where did the weeds come from? The enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him. Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them into bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. You know, I listened to a, a pastor preach on this section. One of the highly interesting things that he did is he, he put a picture up. And he put a picture up of a field of wheat. And you know what? It looked beautiful. And then he showed a couple close-up pictures when you got real close, you could see that not all of it was wheat. Some of it was weeds. But you know what was interesting? That from afar, you couldn't tell the difference. You know, he explains the parable a few verses later. In verse 36, the crowd left. He went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us this parable of the weeds in the field. I would be that guy, right? I'd always be the guy, Jesus, you know that sermon you taught? What, what were you talking about? He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. An enemy sows them as the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so will be the end of the age. And the son of man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom, everything that causes sin and evil, all who do evil. They will be thrown into the blazing furnace. There will be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. We know this is the literal place called hell. To be here lost and to think you're over there with the authority of what Jesus said is a very dangerous place to be. Probably one of the most shocking shocking places of Scripture is the next place I'm going to go. It's found in Matthew chapter 7. Go to Matthew chapter 7. Don't have time to read the whole chapter. He's talking about asking, seeking, knock. He's talking about gates. He's talking about true and false disciples. And then he says something that to me is absolutely shocking. It's found in starting in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What's the next word? Does it say a few? It says many. That's shocking to me. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. Then I will plainly tell them plainly, I never knew you. I don't know about you, but this, this section of Scripture absolutely gathers my attention. Modern translation, modern application, Jesus, did we not come to church? Did we not tithe? Did we not... I used the greeters for a service, and some of the greeter came up to me. Did we not teach? I won't use their ministry again. Did we not serve? Listen, these people are doing ministry, significant ministry. I don't know the name of the evangelist. I believe he was from Scotland or perhaps England, but he came to the United States as a missionary, and by his own testimony, he testified that when he got there, one of the first things he did is went to an evangelistic service where somebody else got up and preached the gospel, and he realized he was not saved. And he got saved. Being here and thinking you're over there is a highly dangerous place to be. And Paul's going to talk about these people in Romans 10. Go back to Romans 10. What do these people look like? How are they characterized? Romans 10. Listen, I see in, I see in Scripture three responses to the grace of God. Number one is complete rejection. These are the people that you share with them the, the, the 
grace of God. You share the gospel with them. They want nothing to do with it. They reject you. They may get angry with you. Complete rejection. The second one is the proper, which is worship, right? This is, uh, if you want to know what God the Father is looking for, then read John chapter 4, the story of the Samaritan woman. It says that Jesus, in, in witnessing to the Samaritan woman, says that the Father is looking for people to worship him in two areas. Who knows their Bible? It is in what? Spirit and in truth. That's what he's seeking, right? That's the proper response, worship. There's a third response to the grace of God, and it's religious behavior. Listen, these people that are here, we're going to see, if you gave them a doctrinal test, they pass it. They believe the bridegroom is returning. But the, the, there is something that the prince of this age, as in Corinthians says, has blinded, has put a veil over them, where they're trusting in something else. It's Jesus plus something. Watch your Bibles. Paul lays it out very clearly, very clearly, starting in verse 2, talking about these people. Number one, for I can testify about them that they are what? Zealous for God. These people that are here who have assented to certain things, they believe they're over there, they are zealous for God. The original word there, zealous, literally means, I, I, you know when I print it out? I print it out way too small. I'll never do that again. Their ardent concern, enthusiasm, emotion of deep, earnest concern. They're zealous people. And they're zealous for God. Let's read on. For their zeal is not based on knowledge since, and this is what they do. Number two, they do not know the righteousness of God. They sought to establish their own and did not submit to God's righteousness. They know facts about, they may believe facts are true, but they're trying to do something else. They're trying to do their religious behavior. The, the, the law was given to be a mirror. So that when we read the law, we would look at our own lives and we'd be, man, I'm full of sin. And these people look at the law and they say, I got it. And they start climbing a ladder. And these people here are trying to establish a righteousness of their own. And listen, it is in my DNA to be just like this. How many people here really, you, you did well in school, you, you studied, right? And your parents were on you. We're some young people to get a witness here. And then you got good grades, right? And you couldn't wait to go home, right? You had the A's, right? You couldn't wait to go home because you'd done this, right? And sometimes we think, oh, God, I'm just going to, I believe in you. And I'm going to do all these things because I know when I get that report card, you're going to open it up and it's going to say A and I'm going to get in. And Jesus will say to that person and will say to me, if it's true of me, depart from me, you evildoer. I never knew you. And listen, there's nothing wrong with doing well. I think we're to do things unto the Lord. But if, we, if we're here and we believe certain doctrinal truths, but we're trying to climb a ladder to somehow get acceptance with God, we're a Pharisee. A zealousness. How many people here remember the story of the prodigal son? Luke 15. Every time I go to New Orleans, I get to preach that, and I love that section of Scripture. I love the prodigal son. You know, at the beginning of Luke 15, Jesus talks about the inside the room where he's preaching, there's two types of people that are there. The types of people that would never, ever associate with each other at that time. You have, first one is the tax collectors and the sinners. And who's the second group? Hey, somebody knows it. It's the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious people. And he tells the, the story, tells two stories, lost sheep, lost coin. Then he gets to the prodigal, and he tells two, and there's two sons. There's the younger son who comes to his daddy and says, Daddy, give me my, my share of the inheritance. In Jewish custom, the younger son would have got 40%. It would have been land. He sells the land, takes the money. Goes off, and the Bible says that he spent the money on what? Does anybody know? On wild living. 
He comes to his senses. He comes back. Daddy is looking and sees him while he's a long way off, runs to meet him, embraces him, accepts him, puts on a new garment. The younger son gets saved, throws a party. Now the younger son represents who? Do you think the younger son represents the tax collectors and the sinners, or do you think the Pharisees? Could be a Pharisee, but in the story I believe it's the tax collectors and the sinners. The elder brother's in the field. He's over here. He's doing religious behavior for the father. He's working. He hears the party. Servant comes out. What's going on? Oh, that brother. Your brother came back. Here's a party. He's, he was lost. Now he's found. What did the brother do? Is he, is he happy? No, he's angry. And finally, the father comes out and says, hey, he's back. Come join the party. You notice he doesn't say that bro my brother. He says that son of yours who spent all of the money on, does anybody know you get a star? I'm not going to give you an A, but I'll give you a star. Thank you. You know your Bible. He spent the money on prostitutes. Where did that come from? Where did prostitutes come from? You know, Alistair Begg pointed this out in his message. I never noticed it before. You know what a Pharisee's like? A Pharisee's a sin detector. And a Pharisee will always see the sin in other people that he struggles with most in his own heart. He's over here. He's doing religious behavior. And if he does it long enough, he thinks he's got straight A's. And now he looks upon other people, and all he sees is their failings and their sin. He has no knowledge of the grace of God. And if these people get into a church and get into leadership, that church will become legalistic. It will all be about rules. And if you've ever been a part of a church like that, where it was you couldn't never follow enough rules, it was legalism, can I say that's not the church of Jesus Christ? Are, listen, are there expectations of behavior once we get here? Absolutely. But it's not a ladder. It's not a ladder. And the Pharisee is the sin. They go around the church. They tend to hop churches. They tend to be about that one thing. They've got it. They've always come across it. I've got this button down and you don't. And if you would just be like me, you would be a good Christian. That's not the gospel. Wherever you're at with your walk with Jesus Christ is a grace from him. Amen? And if people are further along, if you're further along than, than somebody else, then he gets the credit. It's a grace. Nothing to take pride in your own behavior. Amen? See, they're a sin detector. Notice, notice the Pharisee The Pharisee in, I'll look at my small text again. My Pharisee in, in Luke 13, verse 11, the Pharisee praying. Notice this, the second thing about a Pharisee. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you I'm not like one of those people. The Pharisee will not have a true heart for the lost. It'll be all about getting his people that really have it buttoned down and the other people don't. If you, have it, if you go to a church that's full of Pharisees, it won't grow. In fact, it'll probably get smaller. A very dangerous place to be. And one of the most difficult things about a Pharisee is you know the blanket they wear and walk around? It's Scripture. They walk around with Scripture around them. They're quoting Scripture. And they're difficult to deal with. And oftentimes they're lost. And they're trying to climb a ladder. But there's a remedy. Everybody say, praise the Lord for the remedy. <laughs> Let's look at the remedy. Romans 10. Verse 4. Christ is the culmination of the law. So that there may be righteousness for... What's the next word? Everyone who believes. First thing I want you to recognize about the remedy for the people over here, it's available to everyone. 
Nobody. Can, nobody does not have access to the gospel. It's available to everyone who believes. Moses writes about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith. The second thing I want you to know about the remedy is, number one, it's available to everybody. And number two, it requires faith. The writer of Hebrews makes it very clear as he, define, as he, he defines faith. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. You guys remember the doubting disciple? He was the doubting, what was his name? Doubting Thomas. Remember uh, Jesus appearing to people, the other disciples, I saw him, I saw him. And then Thomas comes into the place, right, and he's like, I won't believe unless I what? See. What are the grace of Jesus, right? What does Jesus do for him? He appears to him. He says, Thomas, come here, touch me. Put your finger in my side. And Thomas has the appropriate response to the grace of Jesus Christ. He falls, confesses Jesus as Lord, and worships him. But I'll never, ever forget what Jesus said next. He said, blessed are you, Thomas, because you have seen and you have believed. But more blessed are those who are like me who have what? Not seen and yet believed. Listen, I don't know if anybody here has had a miraculous appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. I haven't. But praise the Lord that I have never seen Jesus and yet I believe. It requires faith. Hope in what I have not seen. It requires faith. Let's read on. People getting excited about this? I am. I'm about to go crazy here. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven by religious activity. By the way, all false religions are just like that. The Muslims, you want to know why they face Mecca five times a day? You want to know why they martyr themselves? You want to know why? Because they're taught to do this. Do religious activities so that they can ascend into heaven. It really is arrogant, isn't it? It's really the whole mindset of that is that I will do a bunch of things and I will compel a holy God to now accept me. I will get straight A's and God will have to let me in. It comes from the pride of man. Who will say in their heart, I will ascend into heaven? Who will say that? Or who will descend to the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead? Verse 8, but what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith we proclaim. And the next two verses want to make me take a hanky and run around the room. I love the next two verses. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be, what is the next word? Saved. Listen, I kind of looked at the, the original words. The word declare literally means a profession of allegiance. The, the, that's the word declare. I'm sorry, declare. A profession of allegiance. The word believe literally means this. To trust, this is, this is amazing. To trust with the expectation that actions based on that trust will follow. Listen, I was in, uh, I was in uh, California and I had a medical scare. I ended up in the emergency room. And you know what? I did call my wife, but you know who I was talking to when I didn't know what was going on? I was talking to Jesus. And I suffer from claustrophobia. And when they put that cage over my head and stuck me in that tube, burp, burp, burp. you know who I was talking to? Jesus. Why? Because I have a faith that there's an expectation that if what I was experiencing was the end of my physical life here, that if I closed my eyes and died, that I would wake up in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, there was an expectation that I have that Jesus is going to do what he said. And the Pharisee is trusting in his own behavior instead of what God promised to do. 
there's an expectation. Read these few verses and we're done. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. The scripture says who? Anyone. Who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call him. Listen, Satan, our enemy, tries to separate us by all kinds of things. Republican, Democrat, CNN, Fox, Toyota, and I'll pray for those Ford drivers. The color of our skin. Do you know one of the things that Jesus said? If you want to know what things are going to be like in the world right before I come back, he says, nation will rise up against nation. You know why it got translated nation? Because back then, ethnicity, people gathered in nations because of the color of their skin. You know the word there is ethnos? You know what it really means? In the end times, right before Jesus comes, ethnic group will rise up against ethnic group. Do you know that's happening right now? White people hating black people, black people hating white people, white people hating Mexicans, Mexicans hating people, everybody, hate, 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 Muslims hating, hate, 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 all because of ethnicity. Yet when John gets transferred into the future on the island of Patmos in Revelation chapter 7, he looks at the host of people worshiping the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, and he sees people from what? Every tribe and nation or tongue. How do you know that? Because there was people there with different colored skin. Listen, there is no room in the church of Jesus Christ for prejudices because of skin color. Listen, skin color is sacred because of the person who gave it. The Lord Jesus knit that person in the mother's womb and gave that person divinely their skin color. And therefore, it's sacred. And if you don't think that's a problem, then come to New Orleans with me. Because there's a lot of African Americans that I talk to who have come into the Church of Jesus Christ in a white congregation and were not welcome because of their skin color. Let that not happen here, and I don't think it is, by the way. Satan tries to divide people. The Lord Jesus does not. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses who call on him. In verse 13, for who? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So what do we do with this? What's the application? Number one, I'm not trying to make eye contact with anybody. Except for me in the mirror, because this was me. But I do want to talk to people in the congregation that are particularly talented. I'm not saying that I am. But there's a trap, and I fell into it. That as I got saved, and I began to, hopefully out of the love for the Lord Jesus, began to grow in Jesus, and I was still newer in my faith, and God started to use me, I began to get puffed up. I'm not proud to say this, but I remember sitting in my church, not this church, not Calvary, the church I used to go to, where the pastor was out of town and somebody else was up there preaching, and God forgive me, but when they got done, I said to myself, I could have done a better job. If God had not got my attention, I could have been just like Hebrews, that I could have continued to drift away, and I could have drifted right back over to being a Pharisee. I'd have left the church. I would have went to the next church hoping that that church had it right. And for the particularly talented in the room, can I say you need to be aware of that? Because it's easy to become a Pharisee. Last point. Uh, we just got back from Israel. I love going to Israel, but the only reason I love going to Israel is because when you go to various locations, um, you get to see where the Lord Jesus did ministry. Otherwise, it's just a place in the Middle East. But one of those places was a town on the Sea of Galilee called Capernaum. It was where Peter lived. Uh, and one of my favorite, favorite stories uh, of Jesus' ministry happened in uh, a, a house in Capernaum. Most people, uh, theologians, believe that was Peter's house. We don't know for sure. 
by the way, they've, when you go to Capernaum now, it's an archaeological site, and they've actually built a church over top of this, uh, the foundations of what they believe is Peter's house. There are some archaeological evidence it is Peter's house. Is it the house? I do not know. But it was pretty cool to be there. But in this story, Jesus is in this house. It's not very big. And, and, the, and, the, and, and the, the writer says that the house was packed. There was no room in the house as Jesus was teaching. Obviously, the stories of Jesus had gone around. Everybody was there to hear Jesus teach. They loved his teaching. And four guys came, and they had a friend. And the friend had a problem. Does anybody here know your Bible? What was the problem? He was paralyzed. It's called the paralytic. They did some highly interesting things. I don't know if you guys are like me, but when I read Scripture, I like to like try to fill in what it would be like. And, and one of the interesting places we went to, I can't remember the place, was a recreation of what a first century town would be like. And we were in an olive press. And when we were in the olive press, the, the, the tour guide said, this is what the roofs look like in the first century. And I was highly interested because not of the olive press, but because of this story. I always thought to myself, how the heck, what it would have been like to dig through a roof? And let me tell you something. If she was right and that was an accurate representation, this would not have been an easy gig. There was no DeWalt tools where they could, no, it wasn't like that. They would have had to like chop and they would have had dirt would have been coming down. And it wouldn't be a small hole. Sometimes I used to think, man, they probably got a small hole. And one of the guys stuck his head through. I don't know if that happened. It's not in the Bible. But I think that something like that must have happened. But I want you to imagine the tension in the room. When the hole was big enough and everybody in the room is now backed away because of all the dirt, they're pressed against each other, and there's Jesus, and then it all became clear. He got lowered down. And everybody in the room knew what? They were doing it because they wanted that guy to get healed. I'll never forget, and let us never forget what Jesus does next. Jesus looks at that paralytic Everybody in the room thought his biggest deal was his legs. Jesus looked at him, and what he says next upsets and infuriates every Pharisee in the room. He looks at him and knows his biggest need. Son, your sins are forgiven. Listen, when I was in that tube... I didn't know what was going on. I needed to know one thing, that my sins are forgiven. I don't know what anybody in this room is going through. I don't know what type of storm you're in. I don't know where you're at. But I can tell you with the authority of God's word as, as, my, as my witness, your biggest need is just his need. You need to have your sins forgiven. And if you're here, I was in, I'm not trying to look at any youth but I have been in youth ministry for too long. You want to know why? Because I've seen kids who adopted religious behavior to fit in with their parents, fit in with youth group, knew all the answers, and now I look on social media and there's not one thing that shows they're a disciple of Jesus Christ. I see nothing but sin. God, I pray they're not relying on some prayer they said when they were a kid. And there's nothing wrong with praying to receive Christ. All I'm saying is... You got to have your sins forgiven, and it requires faith. It requires surrender, and everything else flows out of that. It doesn't flow out of here. This is a trap from the devil. It flows out of here. Your good works are a response to what he's done, the response that Jesus looked at that man and said, your sins are forgiven. And listen, not to sh cut the story short, is Jesus concerned about your marriage? Is he concerned about the man? Absolutely. He looked at the man and said, get up your mat and walk. Jesus wants to do things for you, but I'm telling you, none of those things are promised. But what is promised is that your sins are forgiven. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your gospel, the good news, the remedy, the fact that our Savior came. He allowed his own creation to nail him to a cross, that he shed his own blood, he willingly laid down his life, that he was placed in a borrowed grave, and three days later, he raised from the dead. And that work, and that work alone, we place our faith, our trust, our hope, our lives in that work. 
But if we would just confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that he's raised from the dead, that right now we can be saved. With every head bowed, every eye closed. Sir, ma'am, do you know and allow the Holy Spirit to be the judge, not me. Do you know you are saved? Do you know that when you take your last breath here on earth, that you will open your eyes and be with Jesus? And if you're not sure, if you're Brother Doug, I'm not sure that's me. I'm not sure that I'm saved with nobody else looking. I'm not talking that you have just agreed to certain facts or maybe you have done certain things. I'm saying, do you know? And if you don't, would you give me the privilege of not calling you up, not, nothing like that, and I'm looking around and nobody's looking. I thank you for that. I just want to pray for you. If that's you, I'm not sure I'm saved, but Brother Doug, will you pray for me right now? Raise your hand. Brother Doug, I just, just pray for me. Is there anybody here? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else besides these two brave souls that have just raised their hand? Thank you. I see your hand. I see your hand. Yes, in the center. Yes, back there. Yes, in the back. I see your hand. Father, I thank you for the just the courage it took to raise your hand. Jesus said the counselor referring to the Holy Spirit must come. And Jesus said that they would do a couple things. Convict the world of righteousness and the judgment to come. And Father, only the Holy Spirit can do this. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit will reveal to these people that their only source of having their sins forgiven is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. That they, if they simply would do this in their mind, confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord, believe in their heart that they would be saved, that today would be the day that they would go from lost to being found. Every head bowed, every eye closed. And once again, I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. But just the people, just the people that raised their hand and gave me the privilege of praying for them, would you folks look up at me? Are you serious about that? Are you serious about that? In the back, were you guys serious about that? Am I missing anybody else? If I was missing somebody, raise your hand so I don't. Were you serious about that? Anybody else? Listen, I'm just going to invite you guys just to close your eyes and just, just say a prayer, not out loud. Just close your eyes and say, Lord, save me. In my mind right now, I confess you, Lord, is Savior, I want to believe in my heart that you raised from the dead for my sins. Save me, Lord. For the sake of your son, Jesus, I pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. Listen, we're going to do one song, but then we're going to do something at the end. So listen, I know some people have to go, but I think you want to stick around for the things at the end, okay? So one more song, and then we'll do one more thing, amen? It's 
your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. If you have any questions or you want to learn more about our church, you can check us out simply by going online to feathersoundchurch.com.